Two staffers at the ACLU are on the list. One of the leaders of Greenpeace is on the list. I get these emails I can't bear to open. A, a decorated war hero started crying when I spoke to him two days ago when I was in Denver because you know, he'd flown all these combat missions. He was so brave, but he broke down when he was describing how not only is he on the list for having criticized the administration, his family's on the list. His 15-year-old child is on the list. So this is very bad because, uh, you know, if you follow the Washington Post, you see that the level of surveillance that is now directed at us is at such a high level that when you get on a plane, they know what you're reading, who you're sitting next to, where you're going when you get off the plane, and what the phone number is of the person you're going to visit. It's gotten to the point where before I got into the line for security at LaGuardia, I realized I was carrying a copy of Tara McKelvey's book, Monstering, which is about CIA interrogations, and some of it is classified information, as all good reporting is based on classified information. And I, you know, threw it away, a $30 hardcover. Um, I put it in the garbage, because, you know, I was too scared to go through security with it. Um, so it's very, very bad when there's a security apparatus aimed at ordinary citizens, because you, you start by getting on the no-fly list or the watch list, but there are lists, and this is a classic fascist thing to do. They All right, speaking of fascism, I want to show you something that's been right in front of your face this whole time, and you probably haven't even noticed it. But take a look at this picture. It's Obama speaking in the House of Representatives. Then you have the Vice President and the Speaker of the House behind him. I'm not going to speak on the way that the flag is hanging, but I want you to notice these two things, golden looking things on the wall behind the speaker's podium. These are symbols. They represent fasci. They're called fasci. They represent fascism. So you go and find out what fascism means. They've been telling you what type of organization they've been operating according to for the longest. In Italy, they did it in Germany. You get on the list and pretty soon welfare benefits, job opportunities close down if you're on the list. And other unpleasant things happen. When I got to Vermont, where I was copy editing this book, I had my computer inside my suitcase. And I got to my hotel room and I unzipped my suitcase. And on top of my computer was a letter from Homeland Security in my suitcase. So it's not good. <laughs> so I'm going to just zip through some of the other steps. Um, the, the fifth thing you do in, a, in closing down an open society is arbitrarily detain and release citizens. Um, you infiltrate citizens groups. The ACLU has many lawsuits against uh, the infiltration of ordinary groups here in Seattle, I'm sure anti-war groups, environmental groups, um, total non-terrorist groups are, if it's typical of the rest of the country, being infiltrated by police or intelligence agents um, who like dress like you or me, in fact, they're probably possibly here tonight. And no, seriously, hello. Um, yes, right. And. Uh, you infiltrate citizens' groups, and that's an important piece in breaking down democracy because then citizens don't have the trust level of working effectively together. Um, you target key individuals. I mean, there are some amazing examples of this. And again, I keep getting emails every day. Everyone from the JAG military lawyers, these patriotic lawyers, probably most of them Republicans, who were told to sell out their clients, the detainees, and refuse to because they're lawyers, they're not allowed to do that, it would violate their oath, and th their careers were derailed. To Bill Maher, who said one thing and pressure was put on CBS, was it CBS, on his parent company to fire him. To Dan Rather, who just brought a $70 million lawsuit against Viacom for being ousted because of White House pressure. Um, this is, again, a, a Goebbels tactic that you target key individuals, people in the press, academics, people in the media, performers, um, so, you know, the Dixie Chicks, so that people see that you crash and burn or there are repercussions if you stand up. You restrict the press um, is the next step. And the classic example of this is 
Remember the swift banking story when the New York Times under executive editor Bill Keller reported this classified program that the White House was following banking, financial records. So there was this drumbeat from the White House, treason, 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 right? They should be prosecuted under the Espionage Act. And Melanie Morgan actually said, called for um, a prosecution for treason, and one of the consequences of a conviction for treason is execution. And she's like, whatever, it's fine. So this was really scary to me because I was reading, you know, in a strong democracy, that's just hype, that's just language, it's just like, oh God, they're at it again, you know, the right wing. But in a weakening democracy, it starts to get not so funny. And really not funny when you're reading Stalin and you find out that in 1937, Nikolai Bukharin, who actually was the publisher of Izvestia, which was the equivalent of the New York Times for Russia at that time, was charged with treason and actually executed in the third Moscow show trial. And this espionage, espionage, what happens in a closing society is there starts to be a drumbeat of words like terrorist, enemy of the people, sabotage, espionage, treason. And the definition of terrorist or traitor or spy starts to expand and expand entangling more and more people, more and more criminalization of speech. So, for instance, the blueprint is so predictive. Um, because of what I know about the blueprint, I could tell when a law was passed last fall, expanding the definition of terrorist to include animal rights activists, I knew, yeah, I knew that within about six months, people who looked like the boy or girl next door would be called terrorists and prosecuted. And that's exactly what happened by about March, about six months later. By the same token, you know, we were talking about the blurring of the line and how predictive it is. You know from history that the first people to be tried under the Military Commissions Act are likely to be white and English speaking. And in fact, David Hicks, a white English speaking prisoner, was among the first to be tried by the military commissions. It's so predictive that the tasering of this kid happened right, you know, like according to the clock. So, you know, there's this drumbeat espionage, espionage, you know, th there was this drumbeat to uh, charge people who released or revealed classified information with the 1917 Espionage Act. This sounds sensible, we're at war, you don't want spies, but the history of the Espionage Act, oi, you know, and I didn't know this until I read about it. The Espionage Act was last used during the drumbeat running up to the Great War, the First World War. And it was used to round up people like us, again, critics, anti-war activists, journalists, people who were fighting child labor with, without warrants, um, mass arrests, people were beaten, and Eugene Debs got a 10-year sentence under the Espionage Act for giving a speech about the Constitution. And the Espionage Act arrests quieted dissent in this country for a decade. So it is not a happy thing, the uh, invocation of the Espionage Act against Bill Keller. And, you know, and there are other examples of horrible things happening to journalists. Um, Greg Palast, who wrote Armed Madhouse, was investigated by Homeland Security. And staffers for Associated Press and CBS have actually been seized in Iraq because the U.S. didn't like the images and stories they were producing. And, you know, they were held without charges in abusive U.S.-held prisons. So it's very bad. And the last two things you do in a fascist shift, when you're closing down an open society, I mentioned you recast criticism as espionage and dissent as treason. Remember, Hillary Clinton was called a traitor for, for criticizing the deployment of the war. And the last thing that happens is that you subvert the rule of law or simply declare martial law. And in the run-up to the election, you know, according to the historical blueprint, the months before an election are a very unstable time, most likely to see acts of provocation, hyped threats, um, destabilizing scenes where like there will be a protest and agence provocateur will uh, provoke violence or engage in violence to give an excuse for a crackdown. But more sort of um, routinely, at the end of my argument, I play out a series of what ifs for this last point in a, cla in a classic fascist shift, which God willing we're not going to get to because we're all going to rise up right now and save the country. Um, we are. 
but what is more likely to happen is something more subtle. Remember the U.S. attorney scandal? Okay, so when I first heard about it, I was reading Goebbels. He was so brilliant. And, you know, I said, I bet those attorneys were in swing states. And it's not that I'm that smart, it's that I know the blueprint. And, in fact, they were in swing states, and, in fact, the emails that the White House is not turning over to Congress will show that one of the scenarios they were playing around with was firing all of the U.S. attorneys all at once in a kind of mass purge, Night of the Long Knives. So had they done that, and they would have gotten away with it if a blogger hadn't sounded the alarm, we would already be looking at the end of America because the U.S. attorneys decide to prosecute voting rights groups, for instance, and in a close election, if your cronies are the ones making the decisions, it's pretty much over, even without a coup, a violent coup. And we have this, like, wrong notion of what a closed society looks like. A closed society doesn't look like marching, goose-stepping columns or crematoria in the distance. It almost never looks like that. Once in history, it looked like that. A closed society, even a violent military dictatorship, really looks, has a lot of the trappings of civil society. There are still elections. They're just corrupted. Tyrants love holding elections. It validates them. Hitler held elections. 99% of the Austrians voted ya yeah to their own annexation because there were brown shirts outside the voting booth menacing the people who were counting the vote. Do you guys remember the reports of Republican staffers, young men dressed identically, menacing people counting the vote in Florida? There are still elections in a closed society. They're just corrupted. There's a changing of the guard. It's just, and Giuliani is clearly the designated successor. It's, but it's the same cabal in power, essentially. Um, there's still a judiciary in a closed society. They're just not free to adjudicate freely and go against the regime. There's still academics. They're just watching what they say. There's still newspapers. You just know exactly how far to, to push an inquiry. So at the end of this scenario, there are a series of what-ifs that are very plausible to close down our society further leading up to the election. So now I've completely bummed you out. So now I'm going to shift to what we can do and what we have to do. I mean, this is a really important moment because the window is closing, but history shows that at a moment like this, if millions of people wake up in time and push back, they can push democracy forward and unseat tyrants. And there are amazing inspirational stories that are evidence of this in the democracy movements that brought down the Berlin Wall, people power in the Philippines, um, all over the world, when millions of people push back, they can unseat tyrants, especially in a weakened democracy like ours that is still not closed. But it takes a democracy movement right now. We have no time to waste. It takes millions of people rising up and insisting on restoring the rule of law. Now, when I first started talking about these issues, I thought we could do it legislatively alone. And a few other leaders, or a few leaders and myself, um, started what is called the American Freedom Campaign, which is a grassroots democracy movement aimed at confronting these abuses and restoring democracy in time to save us. And we started out with nothing, and now we have almost 5 million members in our various partner organizations. And we're aiming at 10 or 20 million. And we got commitments from all the candidates to restore the Constitution, all the candidates on the Democratic side. Hillary and Obama were the last holdouts, but they just signed or gave language. And now we're going to the Republicans. Only Ron Paul has signed right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. But this is not enough, I now realize. The violence is escalating. You know, the thing about a fascist shift is that when people start to wake up, that's when they start to crack down harder. And I'm very worried about these reports of massacres in Iraq. Very, very worried, reading today that the State Department is protecting uh, Blackwater in Iraq from being investigated. And I'm very worried about these tasering scenes and scenes of people being pepper sprayed and scenes of women being dragged away in the Phoenix airport that keep showing up on AOL in eerily good video. Because, you know, again, National Socialists created a lot of footage of atrocities early on to freak people out. 